be today talking about LinQ. Uh, I uh, was introduced to LinQ in 2008. By then, it just came out, and uh, I was actually initially suspicious about why uh, LinQ C# -sharp is a statically typed language and why all this is happening. But later, I realized uh, that it is really useful. And uh, today, I will uh, show you some examples uh, about how LinQ we are using. I mean, I'm I'm using LinQ in uh, several uh, scenarios. So before that, a uh, little bit about myself. So I have written three books. Uh, first one was on data structure, and then on .NET generics. Basically, I love data collections and manipulations. And my latest book uh, that is uh, coming up is on LinQ, and it is uh, available in next month. And you can actually go and get a discount coupon, uh, buy it if you will. Uh, but that I will leave up for you to decide whether you will buy it or not after the session. Uh, so w this talk is about uh, uh, We'll, I, I will show you some examples that I have used in the book, and I hope you like it. And after that, we will break for Q and A. But how many people here use C sharp and LinQ? Okay, only a few. Uh, but you you have a general notion of composition, everybody, right? Okay. So uh, yesterday, Venkat and uh, I think in code Jugalbandi, they showed some kind of composition, but that was on on the surface. Uh, but we will show some examples which are really deep. Uh, so this this example is uh, basically we, we all have been programming for us quite a while and we have uh, these uh, loops, traditional loops that we have. And uh, we can actually, we do so many things inside a loop. We have uh, some initialization statements, some variable declaration. I want to show you a video that uh, is, uh, Basically, a general strategy to convert a loop to a link queue statement. And uh, let's say you have a list uh, loop implementation like this. You have some numbers, and then you loop through that number. And if those numbers are greater than a threshold, then you put them in some other uh, data structure, in this case, a list. So, as a first step, is to identify the range across which you have to run the operate in on which range that link query will run. In this case, our range is the entire number length range. So what we'll do is we'll uh, so that is the range. And then what is the condition? What is the condition that is uh, if uh, this number is greater than threshold? That is the condition. So this part is the condition part, and this is the range part, and this is the action that we are taking when, when uh, this condition is becoming true. So if I write this for loop in a for each loop, then it will become for each element uh, in numbers. So at the first step, to convert your for loops to a linq statement is to understand that every for loop can essentially be transformed into a for each loop. Then once you do that, then your uh, query, because linq actually work on a strongly typed collections. So unless you have a strongly typed collections, you cannot uh, you know, use. So first thing is to identify the for loop. If numbers element greater than threshold, then good numbers dot add num uh, element. So as you can see, we have replaced this looping uh, operator in looping variable k. And now we have a much cleaner syntax and we are operating on an object uh, on each element level. So if I, this is the first step, uh, if you think uh, as a, for the for starters, this is the first step and then you can, next step is just to replace, so this is our, this part will replace with where clause 
and this is the range tail and this is the action so what we can do is so if instead we can just reverse this and say good numbers is equal to invisible numbers dot where n greater than okay first so you can make the connection and I'll just name it same so element greater than threshold so if you can see this condition and this condition are the same thing only thing is you just wrapped it in a where clause so by virtue of using link we, we have actually flattened the loop uh, but don't uh, get mistaken link is not magic so the complexity remains the same so even though you are flattening uh, it is not uh, so in order to find the good numbers you have to still traverse the entire so big o notations and all that complexity stuff stays the same it's just that we are being able to tell what we want get done in a very concise manner and set down and since we want to uh, turn it it says good numbers is a list we will project is to do list so sorry and then say good numbers are dump so basically this part here and this part here and this part here is identical so what i'll do is i'll comment out this section for now if i uh, run it And again, coming to this section, this line, this link line. So what we are using the for each loop to see that we will get the same thing: 11, 15, 18, 17. Now I will comment out this for for each part. Everything is commented except I will just uncomment the link part, and then see. So we get the same thing back. Okay. Another important thing to notice is that. Uh, at the end we had two lists but if you drop that two list that link statement does not get executed it creates a query querying which you can get the results so it's basically being lazy as as long as there is no uh, uh, no no operator such that the evaluation is absolutely necessary in this case a two list so when you get uh, write a two list it actually had to create a list and put all the elements, evaluate it and put it in that list and give it back to you. But if you drop the two list, uh, un until the point where you actually need it, it will be great. Okay. Uh, I, I hope you uh, understood this pattern. Any question on this? Okay. So. I will get uh, back to showing uh, how we can remove a nested loop. So for this demo, I am using a tool called Linkpad, which is a really cool utility. Uh, so let us say I have a for loop. let us say I have a dictionary of string and a list of string and I am keeping country capital map, cc map for example, I will say country tourist spot let us say and we will add couple of entries in that.
Now let's say I want to print all the tourist spots. So what I have to do is I have to look through this dictionary. And then I have to create a collection on which I want to hold on to this thing. And then I say tsps dot add range. And then I I will dump it. So dump is a method in Linkpad extension method. So you can actually dump any result. Uh, so this shows like that. But instead of all this, uh, I could have just wrote. I'll comment it out. So this basically is a nested loop. For each of this uh, element, we are going somewhere. Here we had only two. We can go beyond that. And uh, so I'll comment that. And what we can say cc map dot select many and I'm saying m dot value and that's what I want to give to so this guy as you see add range takes an i enumerable of string and select many also returns an i enumerable of result. In this case, value is also a result of string. So I will get. I don't need to actually convert it to a list. So the result stays the same. So that's how you flatten a nested loop. Let's go back to demo. Talk. It it does iterate iterates through all the nodes that you that you have. It, it iterates through all the all the possibilities, all the loop that you are doing manually to the first depth. But uh, I will show some examples. Then it will be more useful. Understand later. So here uh, these examples are. Uh, of uh, uh, from from the book, it's uh, hu human computer interactions, and uh, we all know about T9. Uh, uh, before T9, I, I think the latest one is Swipe. People who have Android phone probably have used this. This is Michael Oral for value, but I could manually select something else. Since it is an A, I'm just going to go to the next word, test message. You can see that the A is there and test is there as well. Now, if you notice what I just did on the S, I... So, without lifting your finger, you can just type, right? So, although it seems really cool, but the idea behind this was, is not new. It's very old. And uh, this is working on an algorithm called the longest subsequence. Uh, so, we'll get to that. So, uh, before that... So here are some amusing examples of uh, subsequence. So as anybody knows what a subsequence is? Okay, a subsequence uh, uh, is a string of another string where the characters of the first string occurs in monotonically increasing indices. Okay, that might sound too uh, difficult to understand. So I've given an example. Let's say ornamental is a word. So all these words, rental, uh, mental, oral, metal, these things are, if you see the characters of the word rental, R-E-N-T-A-L, appear in monotonically increasing indices in the word ornamental. Okay. Uh, so rental is a subsequence of ornamental. But the longest subsequence of ornamental is ornament because that is the longest. 
uh, here is a funny example world is not enough and wine is a subsequence of uh, this thing, world is not enough. So, uh, I will uh, show you the code for uh, achieving this. So, this is an example from the book. So, so, this is a swipe simulation. Can all of you see this properly? Is it too big or does it fit properly? Everybody can see right this. Okay. So, let us say I, I have a touch touch keyboard and I traverse through the characters these characters u, j, n, b, v and by, by way of moving my finger. And uh, so, th this is a simulation of that. So now, what I am doing here is, so I, I have a dictionary, T9 TXT is a dictionary that has lot of words in it. And I, in this, uh, I, what I want to achieve is I want to provide suggestions that like that demo uh, that other guy was showing. Here, first step is I am uh, creating a list of these words. So, if I dump this query, you will see that. So, query I query has some words in it. Okay. So, at this point query has just the words. Now, what I am doing is I, I have created a method called longest subsequence. Uh, please do not uh, think about that right now. Let us say longest subsequence is, is a built in method that if you give two inputs to it and it will return you whether uh, what is the longest subsequence. Uh, and so, for each of those words I loop through and I, I filter them using a where clause. And if the longest subsequent is the word itself, then it is is must be a potential candidate for suggestion. Let us say, uh, if I uh, then if I go back here, you see u is here, n is here, b is here, e r under, s is here, t a n d s. So, if I find the longest subsequence understands is a longest subsequence that I can get back. So, and that matches with the word understands in itself. So, that is a pot match potential match for this. Now, if I word I if I then after that I sort the match this you know in the descending order of their length. So, the most probable word tops the list and then by so I sort them by alphabetically and then take the first four elements and drop them as suggestions. So, I let it fly and see what it produces. So, here is the output. It thinks that I wanted to mean understand. I mean, I do not know what is that mean, but second one onwards, but that is how it is. So, do you like the example? Let us move on to the another one. Uh, spell checking, uh, this is one of the uh, key areas that people have. Uh, Peter Norvig, uh, he is, uh, I do not know how many people know Peter Norvig, you know, okay. So, can you tell others who is? Yeah. So, Peter Norvig uh, was traveling on a plane and he only had uh, some Shakespeare stories uh, in his computer and uh, he wrote a small spell checker using that content of that story as a dic words dictionary words. So, uh, this is his code in Python which is sheer genius and uh, I tried to clone it using C sharp in Linkube. 
and just for the statistics his code is about 25 lines and mine is about 59 lines. So let us go there. Can, can you see this, this code properly? Okay, no, what about now? One second. Now? No? Okay, one second. I am sorry, one second. I probably have to go to his site. Yeah, here it is. Okay. What about now? Can you see this? Yes? Okay. So, so hold, see this what he has done. He has created few methods called known edits and this is a very fancy example of list comprehension. So, he has taken a range and broken the word into two pieces and that he is calling splits. The first part of that split takes uh, first 0 to the ith character and uh, second part is from the ith location till the end okay and deletes uh, like uh, deletes is a suppose sometimes we misplace one of the characters that is deletes and uh, transposes is we transpose one or later for the other maybe in apple we translate you know p and a actually should come in reverse order and but they come in reverse order that is a problem and uh, replacements and inserts. Uh, so, Python is one of those languages which I can read but can write. But uh, so, I, I read his code and translated it. Uh, so, I will show equivalent statements that I wrote in link. So, here is my version. This is to be. Okay, I don't know. So what I did is I also created a array and take the first element. I also created that length array, but I've been uh, unfortunately C sharp is not as expressive as python in this case. So, I had to project that collection into uh, splits which is first and last. First and second are the two parts of the splits. And then I created all the transposes and okay. you were asking about select many. So, here is an example. So, what is okay, let us see. What select many does here is, so in this uh, uh, I have, a, okay. uh, let us say I have a word called apple and if I, if I use this uh, paradigm then I will have A as the first element, P, P, L, E as the second one, then another split will be A, P and P, L, E like that and what select many is doing here is it is joining all this together to create a trans you know uh, replacements uh, for those characters. Sounds okay. okay. And at the end which, which we, are, we are doing is we are concatenating everything together so that uh, we get a list of the possible mistakes and and here uh, this is the training part we are loading all the words in the dictionary which is a dictionary of uh, how many times this occurs in the mistakes uh, dictionary and then we can so i i mis mistook I know mistyped one word mystery and if I run this it will uh, show mystery, I will run it. Okay. 
so this this is a really a large code but i don't expect uh, you to understand and all these things in this demo but i'll upload it in the slide you can take a look but any question general questions you have I hope you, you are familiar with all these uh, link operators where select many, select projections and all that. Okay, this is one of my uh, favorite example. This is a Fibonacci series example. So, uh, how many times you have tried to calculate a Fibonacci number and then uh, you run out of memory <laughs> actually. So, uh, the tail recursions are uh, yesterday Venkat was talking about memoization and which is a really nice concept and I will show you. So, memoization basically means caching, calculate cache and for faster execution. So, you have calculated, if you calculated once in uh, software engineering we have a principle called dry right, do not repeat yourself. I think memoization actually fits into that block. Like, if if you have already calculated something, don't do it yet again. And uh, here, uh, I'll show you what can be done to lazily evaluate Fibonacci series and such things. So, if you will. Uh, Fibonacci series is basically uh, starts every series such series as starts with the seed, uh, seed values and uh, so what I am doing here I have created a sequence uh, exam x static class and I have created two static methods and uh, that works uh, takes a seed values and I am converting them to an enumerable which might seem not useful at all, but you will see in a minute that it is really useful. And then there is a, so what this uh, recurring uh, relationship does is they have a seed value and then they follow a rule to calculate the next value. For Fibonacci series we have the last two values, if we sum them then we get the next value. So here what I have done is, uh, so basically you can encapsulate that in a func. So, if you take 2 t t, if you say func of int and int and the return is also an int, but it does not have to be an int. In case of Fibonacci it is an integer, in case of some other series it can be a other data types. So, what we do is we create uh, take as long as it is true. So, this is also very interesting that as long as it is true we are looping through and then we are creating, taking the first element, last but one element and the last element and then concatenating the evaluated result back to the same result sequence and returning the last value. Okay. So, so this is, uh, I will now let us come to how we can use. So, Fibonacci rule, let us say long, long long and then x and y, x plus y. This means take two element, give me the sum of those two. Now, how it will work here? See, if you want, if you want to find the first five Fibonacci numbers, you say sequence x or start with long 1, 1, these are my seed values. So, I am giving it two seed values and then I am saying then follow a Fibonacci rule. Now, what this does is it goes in there and finds 1, 1 and then it puts it in this sequence. Okay. And if you notice that this, this sequence is the sequence that was passed to it. So, actually we are not creating another structure. and and we are returning yield return. So, we can take as many elements as we want because nothing is that that is the beauty of deferred execution. So, you do not have to really wait till the end. So, instead of 5 I can now say say 40 
very confidently and it will work. So, you see how fast it calculated first 40 Fibonacci series because each at each instance it had to calculate only one addition because everything else is pre calculated, right. And another thing that is very interesting is this looks like a Eng plain English rules like you say start with 1 1 then follow Fibonacci rule then take first 40. As soon as you say take 40 the execution starts, okay. If you do not say take 40 this will create a query that can give you the results but not yet. So, this is a example of a embedded DSL, embedded domain specific language that you can do inside a host language in this case C sharp. So, any uh, question on this? Okay. No questions, either I am boring people or they are not uh, in the honor of my presence, they are not leaving the room. that is of the track. Now, this is uh, another favorite thing that is uh, external domain specific language. So, if, if you see all these things are doing the same thing, which one? Okay, sorry. Can you see it bigger? So, all this code are doing the same thing. They are trying to find Armstrong number. Now everybody knows, I am assuming that what is Armstrong number. Okay, an Armstrong number is a number whose uh, if you sum the cube of all the digits, they sum up to the same number. For example, 1, if you cube 1, it is 1 and sum of 1 is 1. So, 1 is Armstrong number. Then 153 is also an Armstrong number. If you cube 1, 1, 5 cube plus 3 cube sums up to 153. So, that is an Armstrong number. So, at the left, left end you have uh, Armstrong number coded in an imperative style which we have been doing since ages. And on the right hand side you have an embedded DSL which is kind of similar like what you saw right now for Fibonacci and at the bottom is, uh, is a domain specific language for the mathematicians. They do not want to know how to write code and they say okay, as I told some of the cube of the digits of the number is the number itself. Can this be a language? So, that is an example of an external DSL where you do not declutter all the, take out all the uh, programming aspect of it and just give it a free flowing view. So, I, I will show you this uh, last one as a demo. So, I call this, I, I created this language and I am working on to post it on GitHub and that language I am naming as Armstrong in favor of the number Armstrong number. So, here is a small demo showing the external DSL Armstrong number uh, in action. Okay, in this video I will demonstrate uh, Armstrong which is a domain specific language for finding uh, numbers that are interesting like Armstrong numbers, uh, some product numbers and factorials. Unlike uh, embedded DSLs we have uh, here in this uh, example I will show the demonstration of the language that we built in the book. So, if I type the expression like I am typing it here, if you can see sum of the cube of the digits of the number is the number itself. So, this is the definition of the Armstrong number. So, what will happen is once I enter this expression, it will be translated to a lin q statement and then that lin q statement will be evaluated and uh, 
passed and then the results will be showing hamster numbers within 1 to 10,000 range. So let's hit enter. So I'll pause here so that you can see. So this is what I entered. Sum of the cube of the digits of the number is the number itself. And do, from that I generated this query and then I ran it. The input is a predefined range of 1 to 10,000 and would, when fired it provided this, uh, this thing. So uh, in the interest I will show you the live <coughs> example here. I call it arm trunk console and uh, so unfortunately it is it cannot be this font size cannot be increased but I so if you say sum of the sum of the cube and you can do odd digits even digits all these things odd digits these are the key words or the phrases of the language sum of the odd digits of the number is 10. So I entered some of the, so how, how it is interpreting is we are putting it into a stack and then reverse the stack and then taking one element at a time and figuring out what could have been the meaning. That itself is a syntactic sugar, you can omit it. So here you say some of the odd digits. So uh, and this, this is an example uh, of query that you can do and you can do all kinds of bracketing, sum, division and all that. You say sum of, another important uh, interesting number is called factorial numbers. So you can say sum of the factorial of the digits of the number is the number itself. So, there are three such numbers in 1 to 10,000 range and this query, so enough of demo, now let us show you some code. So how, how this is done, so this is an example from the book and uh, so every, everything is uh, created as an, uh, so whatever, uh, every domain, every language, how, how languages are there is computer language or human languages are not different. They are uh, like uh, we have set of vocabularies and set of rules to glue those words together to say something, to express ourselves. So domain specific languages are also not different. So we have something like uh, here in this domain, we have something like cube, square. These are the uh, domain specific language uh, for this uh, elements. And so as you can see, everything is written. So the digits, if you see, so digits takes a signature of digits is like this. So when I say digits of the number, this method gets called. So it is a static, uh, it is an extension method on integer that takes an integer and returns the digits as an, as an enumerable of integers. Okay, and uh, so on and so forth, and then some some amount of plumbing here for the parsing, and then essentially you get uh, what you just saw. So uh, the idea is this is an example of a domain which is universally understood mathematics, and uh, you can translate it to say any domain. So you can do file systems, uh, you know, FTP, what not, uh, web development, uh, testing, all kinds of things can be done. Okay, hope you enjoyed this uh, thing and uh, as much as I did while creating this.
here, 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 here is it. It's a map. It's a plain map, and some kind of. Uh, so here, here you see. So basically, whatever I am typing is a plain map. So uh, if I say times, it will be star. If I say star, sometimes what we say five times four, right? But what we actually mean is four, five into four. So and then we say is or proper divisor or even. So what I did essentially is a mapping between English like phrases to my extension methods. And then glued those together to uh, you know uh, create a query. So if you if you see here in this in this output, see even though see see this sum of the I given the command the sum of the odd digits of the number is 10 and my stack contains whatever I wrote. So sum of is ignored since it is not a keyword then the is also ignored these are just like uh, stop words reduction uh, things and then odd digits is a valid uh, Armstrong phrase. So it is it is registered because odd digits has a mapping in the extension method uh, okay and then the number is also pulled because the number gives me the object on which i can call that method so as 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 you know if i don't have the object integer then i cannot call digits on it that's why i am always typing number uh, digits of the number that of the is just a sauce secret sauce but I that if I do not give the number then it will not work. So it seem may seem like free flowing which is <laughs> free flowing for the context of demo uh, but it can be full fledged using a lexer. Or digit sum no you have to say or sum of the you have to say odd digits of the number that or, or you can okay okay minimalistic uh, so you can say odd digits first you say sum then say odd digits then say number then say is 10 this will also work because we are doing a minimalistic uh, we are not using any stop words but you do not say English like that right. No, though we do not want to stick to the syntax. It can be, but you when you when you when you say some when you explain a rule, you follow a syntax even without knowing it. So you do not say uh, we normally say sum of the cube of the digits, we do not say cube of the digits, cube the digits and then do the sum. We do not say like that. So even though we do not actually mean it, it is our we are already programmed to do like that. Okay. Actually, this does not allow debugging. Then I have to. Okay. So, one second. So, as soon as the input, this statement comes in, we, uh, we there is a method called generate Armstrong statement, and that. Does the conversions now for each of this token? If there is a matching mapping, then we create a builder and then we sanitize the brace because we do not want the brace to be. Uh, yeah, I think, I think this part is fine. Uh, I was interested in the link compiler that you showed, where uh, so you have a string which represents the link query. Oh, and you how want does it to become know an actual how link? did you yeah. how did I execute? Uh, yeah, 
any, any link query. Okay, for that uh, there is a link compiler called evalu Evaluant Link Compiler. Is there? I will show you the page. So that's a op uh, sir, open source tool. Like yes. Okay. So if you go to Codeplex. Uh, And there are actually another one called uh, text to delegate by some Japanese uh, programmer. So here, so if you, if I use this, once I generated my link queue, I pass it on to Evaluant to do the operation. <coughs> cool. okay. So this can be done on a free flowing user interface. So where users can come in and say in voice, okay, give me this customer's data and then you translate it to your query and then pump it. Let us uh, go back to the talk. <coughs> okay, another important uh, interesting thing is meta programming. Um, uh, I do not know whether you are familiar or not. Uh, dot Microsoft is releasing Roslyn. <coughs> Roslyn is uh, so far, compilers has been had remained like a black box. You write source code, something happens. We don't know exactly what is happening, and at the other end, we get some code generated, and it is executing on some arch machines architecture. We don't know what happens inside. But the bad thing about this is, uh, by virtue of parsing your code, compiler has lot of lot of information about the code but it is lost as soon as you come out of the execution. And we are not uh, able to tap into that power because writing a parser is not a trivial task. And with the changing uh, you know, language structure every now and then, it is very difficult to maintain a decent parser which parse. You know. So Microsoft has released Roslyn uh, as a CTP. So you can go in this link and download it, and you need uh, Visual Studio 2012 uh, to install it. And uh, once you install it, it will. It has several APIs, so you can build your own uh, refactoring tools. And uh, say when you right click and say rename as method, rename method or extract method, some same similar stuffs you can do you on your own. But I will not show refactoring today. I will show some examples like uh, uh, how many times you have seen like a method is taking some five arguments and maybe using only two of them. So this, this type of methods are actually potential candidates for refactoring. So before you refactor, you have to know which methods to refactor. So we will show some example. So here you see Roslyn gives you a very clean uh, API to work with. So there is something called a syntax tree. So you can say syntax tree has a static method called parse text and you can pass in raw C sharp code or VB, I, I think you can also pass VB code. And uh, so here I passed you know C sharp, VB, uh, C -sharp code here. In fact, this, this can be any code actually uh, looking at do not judge it by this, but it is a C sharp code let us assume it is compilable in C as well. Uh, so here you say get root, I want to find out uh, there are sev several tokens and method declaration token is one token. So a get root gives you the root of the syntax tree and then you say descendant and then do a filter operation on that and say give me all the methods that has been declared. See how clean this API is. I mean I think this is very hard to beat and come up with something like this. And then you say okay this gives me what? This gives me an i enumerable of syntax node and then I cast it to a method declaration syntax node. So that gives me a method and I projected it to a list and so I now have a method declaration syntax list. Now is the fun is we are now going, 
Now this is all list, now we can use all our link uh, queries. Now we project it to a, uh, and then I say parameters, Z as this point is a method info, method declaration syntax and that has parameter list which is a parameter list syntax and then you say parameters that gives you a list of parameters and then you say p dot identifier. So you can see how, how deep this API is. So it identifies not only the name of the parameter but the type everything. It is beyond reflection okay. and then say identifier dot value text will give you the name of the parameter. Now you get the method name as z dot identifier which is uh, value text and if it is using all the parameter then all of then this condition must be true right body dot get text and two string contents x. So uh, if it is using all the parameter this should be true because z dot body gives me the body of the method and then if I say two string I get it as a string. Okay. And then I am filtering all those that are not using all the parameters and projecting their names and the statement. So as you can see here, I had two methods, two dummy methods, one called fun that has a parameter called z which is not used in the body. So it will print out the, it printed out the name of the method. So if you have really long, uh, you know which ones to target for your refactoring. And this is really super easy to build because the API is very clean. Similar stuff, uh, another one is if, if they say that if you have lot of local variables, it is not good and maybe you can store it somewhere. And so you, this gives you a number of the local variables. So similarly, first uh, like the last time we created a method declaration syntax node and then uh, find the local declaration statement. And so syntax kind, I will just put a drop dot here and show you what kind, see, see such a big list. So everything that you can have you know imagine of or maybe even do not know of uh, is here. You do not have to tell anything, you just put the code. It is not cross language, it is, sh no there are two DLLs uh, that you can use, one is one, two references, one for C sharp, one for VB. So uh, if, you, if you give the language, it has uh, some inbuilt mechanism to identify which language it is and then essentially use uh, some factory method is there. Depending on that, it uses that uh, other uh, syntax tree. If it is you parse it VB code, it will still parse it. There is a fantastic video by Anders Heiselberg in uh, C sharp build event. Uh, US you just type and uh, Anders Heiselberg, C sharp, uh, Roslin, uh, then build and you will get the video. So there he shows how, what is the potential, what is the path forward for this. So here, uh, here it shows the number of local variables it has. So the all, why I am showing all this is because I want to, sh you know, say that. Uh, before and after refactoring, you want to see that your results are appropriate. And for now, you, there are some tools that you can buy like Endepends, which is costly. Uh, so Endepends uh, gives you uh, uh, support for finding all this information. And, but you can do it on your own using Roslin. I think enough of Roslin, I will just have another last that we get to. 
Okay, I have two topics. You guys decide data mining, machine learning, which one you want to just jump into. Machine learning? Okay. So, uh, machine learning, uh, so this is, uh, this is a flower called iris. There are three types, uh, three species, iris versicolor, iris virginica and iris setosa. Okay. And uh, some botanist actually created a long file with all the sepal length and petal length and what not. And the task is to identify the flower. Suppose I, I am not a botanist, I tell you the measurements of that sepal length, petal length, everything. You have to tell me, the machine learning algorithm has to tell me whether this, uh, this is a iris, which flavor, you know, which uh, species, sorry. So for this, uh, there is an algorithm called KNN, K nearest neighbor. How many of you are familiar with that algorithm? Okay. For, for the rest, uh, so if you look at this, uh, you know, picture here, so it's uh, in two dimension, uh, if I plot uh, a point, then it will be somewhere here. And if I say, if you just imagine the origin and 0, 1 is here and 1, 1 is here. So if I say, okay, 0 0.5 is in between, so maybe if 0 has a class, 0, 1 has a class and 0 0.5 might be having the same class. So if you project your, uh, you know, records and post it into two dimension, it will look something like this. And let us say these are the records of uh, cancer patients and these reds are, uh, you know, malignant cases and blue are like benign cases. And we have a new patient record which is green and we have to identify uh, with a, dig, you know, what kind be, what could be the case for this person. As you can see, the circle of confidence inside, we have two, two red and only one blue. So in the neighborhood, we see a popularity of malignant cases. So we might want to say, okay, this new person is unfortunately will be a malignant case. Okay. So you are what your nearest neighbor are, neighbors are. So you, you are known by the company you keep. That's the uh, <laughs> broader sense, if you say. So let's uh, see this example encoded. Uh, so what I, uh, I will show you the file also. So this is the iris uh, file. You can download it, just say iris CSV and you will get this file. So these are the sepal length, sepal width, petal length and the name is the class. Okay. Iris setosa has such and things, varsi color and then virginica. Okay. So what I do is I will load all this data, train, train my network, uh, train my algorithm and then uh, show you a result. So what I do uh, did here is I loaded this iris varsi color, selected the rows, skipped the first one because that is the header, we do not want that and then create a pro created a projection of sepal length and name and random subset is a method uh, available from an API called molding. So that gives you a random subset. So you do not have a sampling issue. So you get a random subset of 100 and then you create the Euclidean distance functions because there are four elements. So we have eight elements and then we create a normal square root Euclidean distance functions that we are using. You can use other distance functions and then at the end we, uh, we just uh, sort the records by, you know, minimum distance from the, minimum distance from the record and, and then create a lookup. If I just, I will just put a dump here so that you see what the lookup is. Now you see here, 
all the elements five elements that are closest to it thinks that it's a varsi color so these are all the closest five closest elements that are varsi color so maybe the test data that i gave its test sepal length petal length maybe this cloud is also a varsi color okay i think we have to end here and uh, if you have question okay and please buy the book please okay it will buy me a coffee that's all okay any questions data mining and how do you say it's machine learning that's what i'm asking knn is a machine supervised machine learning algorithm so supervised machine learning so suppose uh, how you teach your children uh, a b c d so you take a picture of uh, a and show okay tell your son or daughter this is a this is a this is a you do it for say 4 5 months at the end that person you know your kid learns this is a okay now we know that is black but from childhood if we are taught okay that is blue we will tell that is blue similarly this is called supervised learning so we uh, we are telling okay these things are tagged with these things so you try to learn the uh, matching so if i if i give you five kinds of apples you will still recognize they are all apples right you will say okay this is a green apple this is a shimla apple this is a fuji apple but they are all apples but you know how to classify them you will not be saying these are pumpkins so that's how supervised learning works okay that's all thank you